Well, good morning to all of you. It's good to be here. My first time to be in Cleveland. Spent a lot of time running through Ohio in different places, but uh, my first opportunity to actually be here. And uh, looks a lot like home. People, landscape, the homes, everything looks very similar. I was born in Muncie, Indiana, so it's probably, what, about four hours away? And uh, lived just outside of Muncie most of my life, well, part of my life. I've lived most of my life in Texas now. But it's been, it's been interesting. I have uh, enjoyed traveling. I enjoy getting out and doing some of these things. It's a little hectic sometimes trying to, to get to different places, but I appreciate the opportunity to come up here. And after getting to know Bill a few years ago, it's, it's nice to be able to spend time with him. Um, he's a very special individual. There's not too many people that can do what he does. Uh, there are not too many people that want to do what he does. But so we hope he's around a long, long time. When it comes to television, uh, just put me in front of one to watch it. That's about, that's about it. <laughs> because it is a lot of work, believe me. And um, I wish you would also, all these people in your prayers, uh, as you are, very well know, we're all getting older. And uh, that seems to be what the church is made up of these days, are older people. One, especially Mrs. Jasper up in Chatham, she first came to church in 1978 when I was pastoring the Windsor Church. And I had a chance, of all things, to see her two years ago in a Soyuz, uh, British Columbia, for the feast. And uh, last year in St. Catharines, Ontario, to spend some time with, with her and her husband. And uh, she goes back a long way with me. Um, like a lot of people. A lot of people go back a long way. And um, also the, the lady that has Alzheimer's, that's very serious, very tragic. Uh, my mother went through that for four years. She died two years ago. And it's very difficult to go through because at the end she had no idea who I was. And uh, she was the one who brought me into the church to begin with back in 1962, much to my disliking. <laughs> there was just too much going on when you're 10 years old to go to church. <laughs> but I thank her for that because it's been, a, it's been an interesting life, I guess you could say, with where things have gone. What do many of us want for the churches of God or for the church of God or for the people of God? Now that's kind of a loaded question. You've got a lot of different answers, but the one thing that seems to come up first in people's minds are, is something that we see here. There are very few children. I don't know how many children you have, but with all these churches, we're getting old, and there are not a lot of children coming along. Uh, neither one of my children attend church with, with me. Uh, I'm kind of the outcast, you know, just the way it is. But um, they're wonderful kids. They go to church elsewhere. But we're missing children. We think also that um, as we get older, we're not having a lot of younger ministers come along, which is creating a very big problem. You know, who's going to pastor the ones that remain in, say, 15 years? I don't think at 78 I'm going to be pastoring a church. Or I don't even know if I'll be able to remember the scriptures, you know, from the Bible. <laughs> and believe me, that is a problem as you get older. You know, you have these mental lapses. And, um, you know, my wife reminds me of that all the time. And uh, you, you, you hate for that point in, in time to, to advance to that state where... You know, you just keep forgetting things. Well, what about money? That always seems to be something that we think about. But the Church of God International, as you know, last year had a very, very substantial donation uh, of money, which is being put to use. And I think that that gift was given to, for, to CGI for a purpose. And I'll get to that in a, in a minute. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some of that. There are a lot of things that we could think about as to what we need, what we would like to see happen. But the one thing that we are not having is growth. You know, we go back a long time and look at, at the history of the churches of God as far as growth. There just hasn't been a lot of growth. What growth there has been has been the scattering and the movement from one church to the next because of a dislike of the pastor or the formu formulation that they've got going on within that particular group. It just hasn't been the best. And so, yeah, we are lacking growth. I remember back in the late 60s and the early 
70s when every year they talked about 30% growth a year. And that was a problem because they needed finances to move things. They needed more ministers to handle the people that were coming in. They needed a, a bigger hall. Some of the churches had to split. No, I don't use that word. Some of the churches had to um, move to other areas and have an AM and PM service because they couldn't handle all of them in one hall. When I grew up in Indianapolis, the church in Indianapolis was 600 every single week. And then they broke off to one in Anderson, which is kind of between Anderson and Muncie where, where I used to live. They broke off with another one down. I, I don't say broke off. They, they expanded to another one, a smaller one in different areas. And, and churches do this all the time because of, of uh, help and ability and, and, and everything. More convenience for people. So we have to ask ourselves the question, why aren't we having that growth now? Well, it's a good question. But I think it's something that we're going to see answered. You know, in the book of Haggai, the prophet was talking to the people of Israel, and he was referring to what they needed to do as a people when it came time to rebuilding the temple. They were dragging their feet about it, and he made a statement. He said, consider your ways. And I think at times we need to think about our ways and the, the formulation we have, the procedures we have, uh, the, the things that are in place to try to bring more people in. I, I think... I think with this internet, with what we're doing and what with Bill and the others are doing, it's going to be phenomenal. I don't even think we've seen scratching the surface yet because he mentioned some statistics. Um, just, just by way of interest, if I put that, he was talking about some of the things that had happened and taken place. This was from last, a week ago. Uh, from the Tyler Bulletin, 477 new contacts out of 1,068 responses. That's a 45% new responses. I don't think those people are just scattered Church of God people that are from other groups. I think there's some new people there. And the interesting thing is when, when you get onto the Internet, the, the number of people, and if you haven't seen it on Roku, it's unbelievable. It really is because I watch it occasionally. The people that we are contacting and meeting and seeing, you may not see the fruit of some of that work for several years. I mean, look at what Christ did. He started the church and died, and it didn't even begin to take, take off and explode until after his death. Same thing with the Apostle Paul and the apostles. Once they begin to preach the gospel and once they begin to, begin to go out to all these different groups, the Christian church didn't really grow that much all at once. It was later on after their lives were over with. So who knows what this is going to bring, but I, but I think we're going to see some things develop, especially if times get bad, because that's when people want to flock to churches and want to think about God. They're not too concerned about God when things are going great and they're into their football games or basketball tournaments or, or holidays or whatever so much. But when things go bad, they want to come to church. They want to kind of get close to God. You know, businesses chart all the time what they do as a business and how they can increase sales, increase volume, have more money coming in. You know, they start when? For Christmas and Thanksgiving, right after Labor Day. Labor Day hits, Lowe's and Home Depot, they start bringing out everything. And it's Halloween, it's Thanksgiving, it's Christmas. And then once you get through that, the next week they start on Valentine's Day. And it all comes out. And, and they, they gear people up. They're trying to promote what they're doing to, to get people involved and get them excited because they're worried about the dollar portion of it. Now, we do that with the God's Word through the programs over the Internet and through the things that are sent out to people. We're trying to get people excited about God. But there's an element of people out there that really just aren't concerned about God. Things are going too well. But you remember what happened with 9-11 after 9-11, what was it, the percentage that the people that began going to church again? Now, it wasn't permanent, but I think it increased something like 30 or 40 percent back then because the people were worried. And we could wake up tomorrow and we could have the economy worldwide completely collapse. You know, I keep waiting for this to happen because being in business, you, you can't have debt like this without having to pay the price. Sooner or later, it's going to hit. 
And everybody says it's, it's just a matter of when it's going to happen, not if. So when things get bad, I believe we were going to have a lot of people begin to start looking to God and begin wanting answers. And, and you and I are going to play a big part in that, and I'll, I'll show you how. If you would, turn over to Matthew chapter 28. I'm not going to bring you anything this morning that you haven't already heard. I don't believe in doing that. I think most of what we've heard, we just need to keep being reminded of because we tend to forget too often. But what was one thing that Jesus mentioned to his disciples, he said, Go you therefore, Matthew 28, verse 19, and teach all nations. The Greek actually means Gentiles. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, one of the things that you're going to find when you start preaching about Christ to people, and you begin to teach them to walk as Christ walked, you know what you're going to have? You're going to have people who are in disagreement with you. They really are. That's the first thing that's going to come up. Oh, we don't need to do anything. We just need to believe. Well, Yes, that's partially true. I'm not going to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, because you know it. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And then he says in verse 8, or verse 9, Not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's what people focus in on. That's wonderful. That's, that's true. Nothing we do is going to gain us salvation. It's, it's a gift. But they fail to read verse 10, which says that we are supposed to walk as Christ instructed us to walk in them, in those works and things. So that's where, that's where there's a discrepancy with people is they, they, sure, they want to believe, but they don't want to have to get involved and do anything. And that's a whole other topic in itself, you know, law or grace and works. But yeah, we are expected to do something with our lives. We are expected to live a certain way, as Paul talked about. Shall we continue to live in sin? Of course not. But people don't want to think about that because Paul's writings are too complex to understand, too difficult to, to comprehend. Um, and didn't Paul say that the Christ was the end of the law? Well, that's another sermon in itself, but we can get to that. Yeah, Christ was the end of the law. He magnified it as far as it could be magnified. He was the perfection of what the law was supposed to be like. But people want to toss that out very quickly. We are to go, we are to teach, and we are to baptize. We had a big responsibility. If we had 30% growth in the Church of God International, just us, this year, who's going to minister to all those people? I mean... You're talking a lot of people coming in. Bill, myself, the, minister, the few ministers, 45 ministers coming to the conference, and Church of God International increases 30%. Who's going to teach them? Who's going to help them? That's your job. That's partly your job because that's what we are expected to do is we're expected to know and understand and be educated in God's Word enough to help people to come to see. We're going to, we're going to get to something that Paul said and I'll, I'll give it to you now. He said, plant, watered, and increased. And that is not just from the ministry. The people are going to have to be involved as well. You know, in the late 60s, I believe it was, right around early 70s, I was in college from 70 to 74, but at, at the peak of, of worldwide, there were about 150,000 members. It was, it was pretty big. And like I said, 30% of growth a year was, was a little bit of a, a struggle. It, it took planning and, and preparation for it. In fact, uh, how, does anybody remember the America Listen campaigns, what those were? Then he, Bill goes back far enough. Were you in Cincinnati in 1970? Well, they had one in Cincinnati in spring of 1970. I remember that. Okay, yeah. Well, that's... That's where I was that year, was it was at the America Listen campaign. They had, what, six or seven of them around the U.S.? Yeah. And uh, we had about 5,000, I believe, in Cincinnati. 
And uh, I, the girl that I had been dating in high school, we'd been dating for five years. Uh, she went, and my parents' best friends went. Uh, had a lot of people go, and we had some, you know, good response from them. But then they discontinued that after, I think, just one or two years, if I remember correctly. But, yeah, they, uh, we had some, some growth situations there. You know, when you, when you think about growth, God is not trying to call everybody at this time. I never could understand that years ago, years ago when I was growing up. I didn't understand why God was not trying to do things a certain way. Well, when you get older, you begin to understand that as you begin to become familiar with his word. But I understand now why God isn't calling everyone, because what is God's purpose in mankind and with mankind? In 2 Peter, we don't have time to turn to all these scriptures, but I'm just going to tell you. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 says, For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All of what? All of mankind. There's some pretty wicked people out there among mankind in past history, in present history, and what's yet to come in the future. God is not willing that any should perish because Christ's sacrifice and Christ's life was for all of mankind. I know people that I work with, that I deal with around town, that I'm friends with. There is no way if God were to call them that they would change their lives. And I can understand now why God hasn't called everyone, why he's just called a few you and me, because he knows that you and I have the character to change our lives and be different and to become more like Jesus. Some of these other people really don't even know if God exists. The only time they've ever been to a church was when they were maybe born and baptized by their parents or where they go to a funeral. They're just unconcerned about God. God is not something that they are really want to be involved with and want to know. They just, oh, that's interesting. I, I never thought about that. But, you know, we're going to have a big party tonight. This is what we want to get involved with. This is their thinking. This is their attitude. But, yeah, I understand why God doesn't call everyone right now because his whole purpose is to make it where he can call people and they will change and they will want to have salvation. You know, the plan for every human being who has ever lived to have salvation is in place. The question is, the Bible does indicate that there are some who probably will not accept God in his way. But the plan is there through the death of Christ to do that. Before we get into this, a couple more scriptures, or one more scripture anyway, John chapter 6. You have to keep in mind of what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up the last day. So when, when you look at it in those terms, God has, has, has selected you to be a part of something very special. And he expects us to be active in what we do. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and here's what I want to get to. He said in, in dealing with the Corinthian people, they were a rowdy little group, weren't they? They had their problems. <laughs> Similar to what we are today, you know, we have problems and we have to deal with them. And Paul had to deal with the Corinthian, but he said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. And so I want, I want to look at this today, the plant, the watering, and the increasing, and see if there's something as we begin to consider our ways that we may need to think a little bit about getting involved with it and preparing ourselves for it, because I think that we're going to see growth before the return of Christ. Tremendous growth. And I think we're going to see people get involved, not just with Christianity as believing that Christ is the Savior of the world, but actually begin to get involved with doing something about it. Because when I look at some of the prophecies and I see the, the complexities between good and evil at the end time, the one thing that they're not going to like is people who are embracing Christ and trying to change their lives. That, that seems to be one of the one thing that's going to try to destroy Christianity and people who believe in God and, and his son. Not just the belief factor, but the fact that people are going to begin changing their lives. And I, I see a real battle taking place in the future. You know, I, I told my son year, uh, a few years ago, his wife was killed six years ago, and he got married three years ago to a girl who's an American citizen, but she's from India. 
she was born in the U.S., but her parents were from India, and they were missionaries for the Presbyterian Church, I believe, for 20-some years. Well, her parents retired and moved back to India, so he goes back every year to visit them. And I told him a couple years ago, because Dad's a preacher on the side, and, and Dad's okay, but he's just not interested in coming to church with me. And so I tell them and kind of give a lot of information here and there, and sometimes they say, ho-hum, okay, whatever. And sometimes they say, well, that's interesting. Uh, but we've talked religion, and he started going to the Presbyterian Church. My daughter-in-law was just ordained last week as a deaconess in the Presbyterian Church in Dallas that we went to. But I told him, I said, now, when you go back to India, I want you to realize that when the disciples were told to go and preach the gospel, I said, history kind of mentions and corroborates the factor that Andrew was the apostle that went to India to preach. And they looked at me and kind of, oh, okay, ho-hum, that's interesting. But these disciples went to all these different nations. And you can read about that in the book of Acts, chapter 2, where there's about a dozen nations listed as to where people came from for the day of Pentecost. Well, lo and behold, when he went to India, and it's a pretty rough location where her parents live, within just a few miles of where they were was a church. And he sent me a text of it at a plaque out front. It said, the church where Andrew, the apostle, had preached. And so he did a little research on it, and he said, this church has been remodeled about eight times. But he said, this, this is a, the location, that history says it over there, where Andrew, the apostle, actually taught when he left Jerusalem and headed out. And so dad wasn't so crazy or different, you know, because I was right. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was interesting, but he, he's looked at it a little differently from here on. And I just, you know, made it as a passing comment. When you plant the word, how is it done? Now, we don't have a lot of time to go through the parable of the sower, so I'm going to be pretty brief on it. But you, you understand what it takes for something to be planted. It takes a lot of things. It takes soil, a growing medium. You've got to have some place to, to, put, to put the word of God. It takes, you know, plants take water, plants take sunlight, plants take certain temperatures. You know, in East Texas this past year, we got just about drowned in June. We had 75 inches of rain for the year in Tyler last year, and our normal rain is about 42 inches. Uh, and I talked to a lot of old timers, I mean, old timers. They said they had never seen this, but once in their lifetime was one year in the, in the late 50s. And um, we lost all of our pecans last year. There was nothing because of so much rain when it occurred. Apparently it washed the blooms off the, the pecan trees. And uh, the flowers and things that we planted were a disaster. Uh, they struggled, you know, they almost died. We had so much rain in December that um, the, the pansies, we put about 20,000 pansies in every spring and fall. And uh, they just look horrible. They're just now starting to, to kind of re regroup because they had so much water and root damage, and then the rains quit, they didn't have any root development, and it just, one thing led to another. But you have to look at that when you look at the parable of the sower over in Matthew 13 about how to deal with people. It gives you a list of four different types of soil. And one of the things you need to keep in mind when you read the parable of the sower is the focus is on the quality of the soils. Just like trying to give God's word to somebody, the type of person you're trying to give it to. There are a lot of people out there like the stony places where they don't have any area to have a root development at all. There are a lot of people out there who want nothing to do with God. They just don't. It's just not something that's a priority in their lives. They've got other things to do. And so if you try to preach to them, right over their head, they don't care. The wayside, the footpaths, the hard soil where few, few roots have a chance to support the plant. Well, you encounter people that would like to be involved, that would, would hopefully want to get involved, but again, they've, they've got too many personal problems, they've got too many things to deal with in family, that to join the church is, is not going to be a very pleasant thing, and so where they may think, yeah, this is, this is great, but it's just kind of not for me. They're lost. They go somewhere else. 
you know, the ground where the, the seed was sown or was full of weeds. Boy, do we live in a society where our cares and our interests and the world's influence choke out people who want to become Christians. People who really need to be Christian, who really need to have Christianity introduced into their lives and where they could change some of their lives. You see, people go through life and the one thing about life is we do not get rid of the problems and the baggage that we've had from the past. It stays with us. If we've done drugs, we're going to pay for it. Mentally and maybe even a police record. It's going to be with you. It just is. If you've had alcohol problems, it's going to affect you. If you've had financial problems, yeah, you may get out of it, but it's wrecked a lot of your life. If you've gone through divorce, a lot of the people that work for me have gone through divorce a couple times with kids, child support, and in some cases, two and three, four child supports. How do you go through life financially like that? You cannot recover. You can become a Christian and change your life, but that's going to stick with you. It just is. And the sooner you can get to people, the sooner you can introduce them to something like this, where they can change their lives and where they begin to make make corrections, course corrections along the way, you're going to save them a lot of headaches. But for many, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I have a man working for me who's 35. He came from a temporary agency, had some problems, drug problems, been in prison, had a couple theft problems, and he came to me and wanted me to hire him full time. I had a long talk with him, and he said, I am at the end of my life. He said, I'm on probation for 70 years. I didn't believe that, but it's true. He's on probation for 70 years. He said, one mistake, and I'm gone for the rest of my life. Will you give me a chance? I gave him a chance. I hired him in November after the feast. He's able to drive a truck now. He's got a driver's license, which approved, and he, he has not caused me one problem. He's been working for me for almost a year through the temporary agency and then about four, three or four months for me. If I had five more people or a dozen more people like him, I'd hire him tomorrow because he's that good. You know, when, when you reach somebody like that where they see what they've done and they know they need to have a change and you give them that chance, that's what Christianity does for people. That's what Jesus said to the woman that was taken in adultery. You know, caught in the very act. And what did, he, did she probably expect was going to happen? It's over. I'm going to be stoned. And Jesus said, go and sin no more. And you and I have that opportunity to tell people that. No matter what you've done in life, let's change it and move forward. Just like what we have all experienced and gone through over the years with the, the church, so to speak. The problems that have developed. Those things are in the past. They have stuck with us. In some cases, we can't forget about the things that have taken place. But we need to solve the problems and move forward. Because that's where the future is. The future is not in the past. We can't change the past, no matter how much we want to change it. We can only make course corrections. And hopefully, with each generation, those generations are going to get better. You know, the whole purpose of raising children is to help them grow up and... and omit the problems in their lives that we've gone through and the mistakes that we have made. Hopefully each generation will get better and better and stronger and more wise. But I don't see that happening today. I see people going, well, we're getting wiser. A lot of things we don't need to be wise about. And with the information network, what it is, it's creating a new type of problem. So you, you've got to have children who have that foundation where the Word of God has been planted in their lives, or people who can have something planted in their lives where they can change. And Jesus said it wasn't going to be easy. You know, what did he say? When you go into this town, they don't listen to you, shake the dust off your feet and go to the next. So, yeah, you and I have got our hands full. I remember my mother when she started listening to the radio broadcast back in 1958. She and my dad listened to it, and I was six years old and heard this preacher up on the radio screaming and yelling about the Word of God and everything, and I didn't know anything about it. She started taking this Bible course, and she was so involved with it. 
she went to her mother and said, I want to share this with you. This is the most wonderful thing that has ever happened. They fought for 25 years. Because my mom, my grandmother did not want anything to do with what came out of Pasadena, California. When I was 10 years old, you know, she brought Christmas presents over to the house. And my mom said, we're not taking Christmas anymore. We're not keeping it. And she made her take them back to the car. And my grandmother got them out, back out of the car and put them back into the house. And my mother picked them up and she brought them in and took them back. And this went on for about an hour. And I'm sitting there going like this. I didn't know much about what Christmas was a problem for. And the, these presents look nice to me. <laughs> but but they, they fought like cats and dogs all their life. My mom wanted to plant this into my grandmother's mind, and my grandmother didn't want it. She didn't want any part of it. And so you've got to be careful how you do some of these things when you want to try to plant something. You know, be subtle. You know, make it happen, first of all, and let somebody work with it. Make them want to ask you more questions so that they can come to you and you don't have to, to force it on them. Because God doesn't force it on us. You know, one thing about Christianity is that Christianity is something that we can choose to get involved with or we can reject. God doesn't force us. So don't force it on people. Just try to make it interesting so that they're always wanting to know more about why. And when things are bad, when things are horrible, and people see you with a calm face and not too concerned about it, and, they, and as, as people have said to me over the years, how can you remain so positive and so calm when things are such a mess? Because we know how it's going to end. And we know the end, the conclusion of the matter, is so much better than what it is today. I don't care what we've got, how much wealth we have as a nation or as people or the things that we have available to us. We are wealthy compared to the world, but this is nothing compared to what Christ has to offer to each of us. Jesus said in Luke 14, we'll move on here very quickly, because I don't believe in speaking more than 50 minutes max. I sat through too many two-and-a-half-hour sermons growing up. Can't do that to you. <clears throat> if any man come to me, Mark 14, verse 26, and hate not his father and mother and wife, children, brother and sister, his whole life, everything that's involved with him, it says he cannot be my disciple. A disciple is one in the Greek who is an imitator of the teacher. And that's what a lot of Christianity does not like to embrace. Because if you imitate the teacher, what do you have to do? If you follow Christ and walk in his footsteps, as Peter said, that means you've got to change your life. People don't want to change their lives. They want to accept God, but they don't want to have to make the changes necessary. It's a simple fact. Watering. Does it matter how you water? Yeah, you, know, you can... I heard this for a fact years ago. You mean to tell me that you've been coming to church for two weeks and you haven't stopped smoking? How can you continue to do that? I quit the first week. The person never came back to church. You can't water people that way. You can't work with them. You can't improve their relationship with Christ when you come on that strong with them. You know, you need to ask people how, how they're doing, you know, anything I can do to help. You know, any, any, anything that you, you need. And just be available to them. You know, if you force yourself on them and tell them, you know, you mean you can't stop sinning? Well, I did. <laughs> I mean, what, what's that going to do to people? These are things I've heard over the years as I was growing up. And, and, and you know, you, especially when you're saying in a group at church and several people hear it and they kind of, they look around and say, well, this guy's still sinning. You know, what's the matter with him? I mean, who wants to come back when, when you expose somebody like that? Yeah, I still sin. I don't like it. And I have to ask for repentance just like you do. And I have to go before Christ, before Passover, and ask to be forgiven. Now, there are some politicians that say they don't, they don't need to ask for forgiveness because they've never done anything wrong. <laughs> Let me tell you, when I heard that... Uh, that, that got what hair I had standing up on end. That's, that's, that's dangerous when somebody has that kind of an attitude. 
Anyway, John 15 is the best thing you can do in, in trying to help people that are coming along and giving them water so that they can improve. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, John 15, verse 4, except if it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same shall bring forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. You know, and I know that for a fact. My greatest fear growing up was having to speak before a group. I did the stupid thing and ran for senior class president in 1970 and I was elected to it of my high school in Shenandoah High School in Middletown, Indiana. And then I found out I had to give a speech at graduation. I couldn't get out of it. I was horrified. I said, I would never do this again. If it hadn't been for God's spirit over the years being with me, I, I would never be able to do what I do today. Uh, I just wouldn't. And I, uh, Mr. Hendricks asked me last night, he, he was talking to me about sermons and things that I'd given. And, and yeah, if, if I, I give it 100%, but that's not enough. If it wasn't for God's spirit, there is no way. No way. You know, I don't get as nervous anymore, but I, I do tend to know where the strength comes from. It's not from me. It's, and, and you can do the same thing because Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You can too, I guarantee you. Jesus went on to say, no, I missed that back in Luke 14. Anyway, after it talks about being his disciple, it says they're going to pull you up before people and they're going to ask you to do things, but don't worry about what you need to say. The Spirit is going to give you the strength and the knowledge of what to say and how to say it. So don't worry about dealing with people. God's Spirit will help you in dealing with people. You know, Christ's death was out there to save all the world. And we are supposed to be able to give people an answer when they come to us. We're supposed to be knowledgeable enough that we understand what to do, what to say, how to say it with God's help. And we have to be able to study and know that along the way. Remember this, though, when dealing with people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. You know, what you know, you know, and you believe and you understand. Don't be going back and try to reprove something. There are too many people out there that are looking for something new all the time. And I could tell you a, tra a tragic story. I don't have the time to do that. But when, when you go to a congregation and, and ask them what they want to study for Bible study, and you recommend Paul's epistles, and they tell you, no, they didn't want to study Paul's epistles because they've done that too many times. And then you re re reference the harmony of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How about studying the Gospels? Well, no, we've done that too. We want something new. When the church board tells you that, this was a church of God. When the church of God tells you that, you've got serious problems. They wanted to go into something new, and, and they did. They went into the one God theory. They went into Hebrew roots. They went into the phylacteries and the robes and a lot of things, and it, was, it destroyed a church. But you need to realize that there, there is, a, there is a, a roaring lion out there that's seeking to devour each and every one of you and me and everybody that wants to try to come to make changes in their lives, and that is Satan. So yeah, whatever you do, whatever you say to people, however you deal with people, you need to be aware that, that there is another force that is there that is wanting to take control of them as well and to detour what you have given to somebody so that they won't make it. The best way that you can help to water and help, grow, help people grow in, in Christianity and grow in knowledge is found over in 1 Peter chapter 4. I'll go through it very quickly. How long have I been up here? About 40 minutes? About 40 minutes. Okay. Very quickly. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered in the, in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For who, he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. People don't like to hear that. Oh, you mean I've got to quit doing this? This is fun. No. We have to change our lives. 
that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Verse 4, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. People are going to notice your example as a Christian because you change your life. And you don't do the same things you used to do. They're going to see your example. You're going to be a light to the world. You're, you're going to be someone that is up on a hill like a beacon. They're going to see something different in you because you've latched on to something that is helping you to change. And that's going to be the biggest effect on people that you can have. They're going to see your life begin to make course corrections. And that should be encouraging to them. And they can take it or leave it. it it's up to them. Character is something that you can't legislate to people. Character is something that God says we have to build and do on our own with his help. You know, when you, when you go to a group where they tell you how to do everything day in and day out every few minutes, that's not character. Character is what you do when you are by yourself, when you are alone, and when you have full mental capacity to make decisions. Finally, Paul said the increase, that God provides the increase. I'm trying to prepare you because I think we're going to have some increase before too long. I really do. We don't receive a large donation like that without a responsibility with it. And I have always felt when we, when we went onto the internet and went onto Roku, the, the people that are touched by that and seeing that, that didn't see it before. And the financial benefit is that the, the cheap financial part it is of having to reach more people that way is phenomenal. And I think we're on to something that may take a few years, but we're reaching people. You know, now there are reasons why God doesn't provide an increase. You know, is God going to bring people and have growth impact a church where there are multiple problems, where people cannot decide within a congregation what they believe, where their attitude is not right, where where there's all sorts of problems that we have experienced in the past. Is God, is God going to, to bring people in, new people in, people that have a chance to build character and change their lives? Will he bring them into that type of environment? I don't think so. I think we have to make sure that the church is ready for the increase. It's not a matter of how big the building is or you know, how, how expensive it is or there's a church in Tyler that I have a, as a client, been a client for over 20 years. 6,000 people a week. It's a Baptist church. They're the ones that I went to, we went to Israel with, my wife and I did. They go every year. They wanted to build a new building. They, they take up about five city blocks. They wanted to build a new building several years ago and expand. They had to raise, raise $27 million to build this, and they weren't going to build until they raised it. They raised it in six months. A lot of rich people in Tyler and a lot of rich people attend this church. But fabulous organization. You don't need six city blocks to bring people in to Christ. Read the book of Acts. What did you find? A very basic, come over to our house, meet as a church, handful of people, and study the word of God. That's all that took place in the New Testament. That's all that was necessary. They met in the synagogues, and you know, finally the synagogues probably threw them out from all indications because they were so different from what some of the Jews believed. And so they started meeting people's homes. We could do that again if we had to. You know, if 10 of you here had people come to your house, say a dozen people come to your home, you don't have a dozen ministers. So who's going to teach them? You. You who own the house. I think we're on to some big things. I, I really think we're going to see some growth. I don't know when, but I do know this. I know that God expects us to be ready for it because he just might do it. And another thing to consider, people say, well, if, if there, there just was a miracle or something to, to show that this was it. If we had miracles today, you wouldn't have enough parking space for the media around your house. And you think you wouldn't have to answer some questions. You want to deal with the media? Not me. I mean, they can't even keep the story straight when they've got it written down in front of them. 
But if you had miracles take place today, you know, I would rather God did miracles through healings that people can say, well, you know, they may have misread the, the radiology, you know, the, the x-ray, you know, and we, it may not have been just real clear. Fine, let God heal people that way where, where there's a little bit of doubt. Because I guarantee you if, the, if there was a gift of healing, there would be media following you everywhere you went, which would com make things complex as far as preaching the gospel. So that's not what they're concerned with. They want the miracle. So yeah, we have to deal with that. In conclusion, over in Amos chapter 8, very quickly, I think we're going to see big things. I, I, I'm not prophesying anything. I'm just giving you my thoughts. <laughs> but believe me. But I know how God does work. And I think, I think when I look at some of these prophecies, I see things that are going to take off before the return of Christ, whenever that is. We've got too many problems. And Amos talks about the problems and the basket of summer fruit that is presented to him, where he says, basically in, in this statement, a basket of summer fruit, the end has come upon my people Israel, which really means the time is ripe, the end has come. God has done all he's going to do. He talks about the problems that the people had and how they were t dealing with the nation of Israel, the problems that were there, and how that there's going to be an interruption of a natural order to get their attention. But he says in verse 11, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst, for water, but for the hearing of the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from north even to set to the east, and they shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. You know, if something were to take place, and I didn't think this a few years ago, but if the right person gets in office and didn't want to hear about Christianity, he can shut down Christianity on the internet, shut down Christian, Christian broadcasts on the radio. Um, it's not as far away as what I used to think years ago. It would be tragic because they don't want to be told they're wrong. They don't want to be told they need to change their lives. They don't want to be told what God is going to do. They don't want to hear Christ is coming. I never could understand in Revelation where it talks about Christ returning and the nations fighting him. I can understand that completely now. They don't want any part of it. Mankind wants their own way. And you and I have a responsibility to try to help them to come to see that that is not the best way. And they have a chance to change their lives and they have a choice. What is that choice going to be? Well, if I can leave one thing with you today, it's just the fact that all of us need to be very well ready for the things that might, that might happen where we experience great growth. Because the way the internet is going, 45% new contacts each week, that's a, that's a big percentage. And if the right thing happens and people come to suddenly say, hey, I need help. I need you to come and visit me. I need you to be with me. I want to come to church. Then so be it. But you and I have that opportunity because just maybe you and I will have an opportunity to be the catalyst for somebody changing their life and committing themselves to Jesus Christ.